So I will try to. Uh, uh, I'm not going to teach you actually artificial intelligence today. I think you know more about this than me. What I will do today is I will try to show you how we may apply artificial intelligence in our daily work, how actually it's applicable and, and whether it's applicable, to give you the strategy, to show you the strategy, the potential strategy for you, where you can study, where you can apply your skills, and how you can make the world better in the future. I, I was uh, preparing for this lecture just, uh, just last week, and I, I, I tried to, to research something about this, and I found this quote by uh, Gartner, it's quite popular agency who is predicting the future, and they are saying that in just two years or three years, 40% of application development projects will have AI co-developers. I have no idea what it means, actually. I don't know what they mean by AI co-developers. Is it going to look like this? I don't know. And I uh, made a vote on my Twitter account just the last week to, to collect the opinions of some programmers, and I asked them uh, the question, what exactly is artificial intelligence? And uh, a few hundred people made their answers. So how would you answer? What do you think it is, artificial intelligence? Marketing. Is it, is it what? Marketing. Bot. Marketing. Bot. Or maybe it's thinking computers. I think thinking computers are like that, yeah? They're like thinking computers. Or maybe they're just fast algorithms. They just work faster, and that's it. For example, when you, uh, I don't know, when you go to the metro station, you put your car, and the metro station decides, is it okay for you to go in or not? Is it artificial intelligence or not? I don't know. Anyway, the answer was this. So 43% of about 500 people, 500, most of my followers on Twitter, they are programmers. So they made answers and they said it's marketing buzz. So which means that basically nobody really knows what artificial intelligence is. It's just two nice words which do not actually explain anything. Some of them think that this is just thinking computers, just 26% of them fast algorithms, and 20% just don't know what it is. I think I'm here. Anyway, uh, I, I, th th so artificial intelligence is something we just don't know, just a big slogan. But, however, there is something which we can define. It is machine learning. So how many of you know what is machine learning? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so you probably know more than I do. So I will, now I will, in just a few minutes, will try to explain you what it is. I made an explanation in simple words for those who don't know what machine learning is. And I will explain to you, if I make a mistake, correct me. Because I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in this. I just, I'm more expert in software development in general, but not machine learning. So this is how I understand it, how machine learning works. Imagine we want to solve a simple problem. We have a team of programmers. Yeah, get it. Let's say we have a team of programmers, and this team of programmers is working in front of us, and we are the managers of this team, and they produce some changes to the code base. So every day this is time, and this is the amount of changes they make every day. So every time we measure how much, how many lines of code they touch. I call it hits of code. So how many lines of code they delete, how many time lines of code they introduce, like how active they are. Let's say this is the activity we observe on the team. So we measure them for, let's say, I don't know, 50 days, and they, they start the project here and they finish the project there. And they make modifications to the project in some, in, in, at some speed, at some, at some um, frequency. So at any point of time, for example, the day number, yeah, I got this. The day number 15, they modified 331 lines of code. And so, now we're trying to build an artificial intelligence. We want, our task is to create an AI predictor of how long any project will take. So we want the machine to think and look at any project and say, this project will take 50 days. And this one will take a year, and this one will take 30 days. So we're trying to build, let's imagine, we're trying to build that predictor, that smart machine. So the first step for us is to, that's what they do in machine learning, the first step is to observe a number of cases, a number of different projects. So we measure this activity in four different projects, for example. And then we need to select the mathematical model which is suitable for this type of activity. The model is a formula, for example, this one, 
we say, you know, it seems that in each project it's a wider dependency, so we can draw a line which more or less resembles, which looks like the, the activity. So in this case we may say that it moves like this, so they start slowly and they more and more actively move forward. In that case they start faster and they produce less and less. So it is, it is a, a, a line. In this case it looks like a line, right? right? The points are around that line, so the activity is more or less line. So that's the first model we, pr we propose. So we're trying to find the model, that's the first step in machine learning. We're trying to find the formula which describes what's going on. The formula with a number of parameters. We just suggest the formula. It doesn't look good because it doesn't look like it really... It's, it's not good for us, for example. This is our first try, first attempt. And we don't like the formula. So we try another one. Maybe it's like this. Maybe the dependency is, is this. So they start slow, they go faster, then slow, and then again faster. In all projects. Maybe. So we're guessing. We're trying to find the mathematical model. We're trying to model the world. So the real world is this, dots. And then we're trying to put some... Uh, to approximate the world. To introduce something which is mathematically easy to describe with a simple formula, but it looks like real world. Okay, not good again. We don't like this one. Let's try another one. Maybe this one. This one is okay for us. Because it seems reasonable. When they start, they, they, they start slowly, then they move faster, and then they slow down. So any project, we can say that any project looks like an activity that starts slower, goes faster, goes faster, and then slows down again. So maybe it's a parable. Par parabolic function. Maybe. I mean, we're just suggesting. So in each project, it looks like this. So this is going to be our mathematical model. That's the first step in machine learning. We select the model. We select the formula which describes our world. The second step is we train our machine. We train our formula. That's how we do it. We, 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 we train the formula for, for the specific project we have. We select the project the one where programmers are working. We look at the past. We know this is how they produce now. That's the results they produce now. That's up to a certain point. This is the point in time. So we know what was happening before. And according to these numbers, we train our formula. And we understand that the actual parameters in this particular case, they're going to be like this. So we find we, 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 uh, we get our formula closer to the real world to this particular case, to this particular case. So we, we train our model. This is our model. This is the result of the training. And this is visually how it looks. So we know that the past, this line from the past, according to these red numbers, according to, to these red dots, it tells us that the future will look like this. And now we can make a prediction that in the day 56 or 58, we most probably going to produce, the team will produce 278 lines of code. So that's the predictor. So we actually now built an artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence which was able to look at the past and tell us what's going to be the future. Of course, maybe it's making a mistake. Maybe the actual number will not be here. Maybe the team will work you know, slower. Maybe they will work faster. But we expect it to work according to our mathematical model of the future. So basically that's how machine learning works. First of all, we decide what's the model, how we can approximate the real world, how we can describe the real world with a simple function. Simple or not simple depends. Sometimes in real applications the function is very complex. This is a very primitive function. In real world, the function will be in real, in real life. When you work with real machine learning tasks, the formula will be much longer. But in simple way, it's a simple formula which says the world looks like this. We know. That's how all teams in the world work. We assume. And then we train this model, find out the numbers, and then we say, okay, now we know what's going to be the future in this particular way. That's machine learning. That's as far as I understand it. Now, and, and the most, that's what people who work in, 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 uh, in our teams, that's what they told me about machine learning, is that the biggest problem is to find the model. So that's the biggest, actually the biggest task for all researchers is how to find the model. 
The moment you find the model, the moment you know the formula, the rest is easy. You just train the formula, you, you, know, you give the numbers, you, you, roll, you draw the line, and then you predict the future. How you find this formula, that's the question. That's the research. That's what researchers are doing. They're trying to find, for every specific case, they're trying to find different formulas and say, now we know how the world uh, looks. That's all I wanted to say about machine learning. Did I say something new for you? No, nothing. You knew it before. Anyone heard anything new up to date? Nobody. Okay. I'm not asking students only, because <laughs> I know there are not only students here. Okay, good. So I, at least I didn't make a mistake. And now I'm going to tell you more about software development, something which I know more than machine learning. So I will, uh, I will tell you how software projects in big companies look and how we can apply this machine learning, this artificial intelligence or whatever, any methods of, of thinking to, to the process. First of all, let's take a look at the whole process. So how do we develop software projects? We make nine steps. That's my opinion, my personal opinion. But anyway, the nine steps. The first step, we understand what needs to be done. We call it requirements. We look around, we understand what needs to be done. That's the first step to develop anything, any piece of software. Second step, we design it. We sit together, we decide what needs to, how these requirements can be applied to software and in what pieces we need to make software of. So what is going to be, what, what's going to be the piece of it. Then we code. We actually write code. Programmers, they again sit together or maybe alone and then write code. Then we create unit tests. Sometimes we create unit tests first and then we code. But we, on top of code, we need to have unit tests. Code plus unit test are two important pieces of actually something that works. So any software consists of two parts, the unit test and the code. We'll discuss it a bit later, each step, but now I'm just drawing you the map. Then we do static analysis. I mean, good software teams, they do static analysis. They, they run some software which analyze uh, the code and tell them what's good, what's not good. Then we do code review. So when the code is ready, I did the coding, I did the unit testing, I run the static analysis, they all look together okay, and then I send it to somebody who is another programmer and I say, can you take a look at it, can you review it? And they review, and they say, yeah, good, it's good, you wrote the good code. The next step, we package this stuff and deliver. So we put these pieces together, these files, we package it, we make it a software, and then we put it to production or to, to some place where people can run, maybe to the mobile phone, maybe to production server, somewhere. We deliver, we call it deliver. Some people call it DevOps. Now it's a very uh, popular word, DevOps. But actually we deliver. Then we do manual testing. The product is there, we try to, to break it, we try to test it, how it actually works. And finally, we show it to our customers and validate and ask them, is it okay? Like, is it something you were asking for? Do you like it? And when they tell us that they don't like it, in all cases, they always don't like it, then we start from scratch. We go again and again, requirements, we collect requirements, we design, we code, we unit test, we static analyze, we review cycles. We do these cycles multiple times a day, multiple times a week. It's always like this. The same nine steps. That's how software development looks. So you can be at any point in this structure. You can do testing. You can be requirements collecting. You can be you can be somewhere there. And now we will discuss each step, nine steps. We'll discuss each of them and see how artificial intelligence can help us to do this, this, this to, to do each step in this uh, in this map. So the first step: requirements. Requirements. This is how we understand what needs to be done. We programmers, not only programmers, testers, everybody, we need to understand what needs to be done. We need to, first of all, talk to customers. We talk to customers, we listen to them. The second step, we write down what we just understood. So we collect requirements, then we write it down. Then we present these requirements and collect their opinions. Is it what you want? Is it what you, is it what you, is it what we need to develop? And then we get a, uh, then we shake our hands and say, okay, this is, this is what we need to develop. This is what we want to develop. These are our requirements. Uh, it looks like a simple process. It looks easy on these pictures, on these on this images. But in reality, it's not so easy. There is a document from uh, IEEE community. Who knows what IEEE is? A few people. 
Yeah, so the IEEE is the, is the, is the large, very old institute which uh, publishes standards for, uh, for, for software development steps. For all of these steps, they have some standards. So for requirements, they have a standard which says that good specifications should be correct, unambig unambiguous, complete, consistent, ranked, verifiable, quantifiable, and traceable. I have never seen any documents in my life which are actually you know, traceable, complete, and everything like this. The requirements which we produce are very bad, usually. They are horrible. They're, they are... Everything which is here is quite the opposite. So they want, this institute wants, they, they want us to produce good documents, we produce bad documents. It's just a reality. Why? Because we're people. We, we make mistakes. We cannot actually write clear, complete, consistent documents. We write what we write. So we get a document. Now I'm getting to artificial intelligence. So we get a document, and then we have an artificial intelligence. We can ask the machine, we can ask some algorithms, some smart thinking computers, to analyze our documents, to take a look at the text we write, and tell us what's wrong there, and tell us, and tell us many things. For example, it can tell us what is wrong there. The artificial intelligence may say, I find 55 defects in this document. 55 places where something needs to be fixed. Or artificial intelligence may say, I estimate these requirements to produce a project of one year long. That's a good, good, good job for artificial intelligence, to look at the requirements and produce the estimate. Uh, it can produce even the UML diagrams. Who knows what UML is? So UML is actually the, the language, the standard for drawing diagrams. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a bit later. So we can produce some design immediately from requirements. Again, some AI or some smart computers can, using maybe machine learning, can take a look at the requirements and produce the design. And it can also write code. Even code, it's even possible if the requirements are properly defined, then we can generate code immediately from the requirement. The requirements say the user has to be able to download the document in PDF format. Then we generate the code which converts the document to PDF. Maybe. It looks like the future. I have never seen that in real life. I haven't seen But that's something which some people say may be possible in the future. Just to read the document and write the software. And maybe write some tests. So if the document says that the user has to be able to download PDF, then we can automatically create a test which will try to download the PDF file. So that's what I think the AI can do. Actually, there is a project which does it. I found it on the internet, it's called, it's called Scope Master. It's a startup, you pay them, you send the requirements document to them, and they tell you what's wrong with the document. Sounds like it works already. So I don't know how much machine learning they use inside. Most probably they just analyze the text and they just they just check you know, for certain patterns, they check for some missing words. I don't know what they do, I've never tried them. But they exist. So that's the first part. Requirements, AI can help us to work with requirements. This is how you, this is where you as students now and programmers in the future can contribute. Because I don't think that this scope master is like a fully working system and they will need more systems in this, in this space. Step number two is design. I'm listing them here. So step number two is design. Design is uh, uh, design is basically drawing diagrams mostly. So it's understanding what needs to be done and drawing pieces of, of, of rectangles and arrows uh, to to decide how to how the real software will will look. I I put four diagrams here. Who knows uh, the name of at least one of these diagrams? Somebody said that they know UML. So what's the name of this diagram? For Sequence diagram, that's right. This one, anyone knows? Process. It's deployment diagram. This one? PR. The PR or more like UML name is class diagram. Yeah, they're class. And this one is activity diagram. So well, this is just basic instruments of any architect. If you are the software architect, you have to work with the, you have to work with this. You have to work not with not only with the source code, but you mostly work with diagram. 
You have to be able, if you, I'm telling you as students, you have to learn UML. If you, if you understand UML, if you understand diagrams, you will, be, uh, you will be very useful for a serious software project because you will be able to, uh, to look at the software and explain to everybody else how it's designed. And that's very important quality, to have an ability to explain how things work. So basically, design is drawing diagrams. Drawing diagrams and deciding how the software um, you know, stays together. Again, how we can apply artificial intelligence here? We get the diagrams, we send these diagrams to artificial intelligence, some machine. What do we do? What do we get out of this? We can find bugs, for example. The machine may say that you have two diagrams and they don't match. Like you have certain elements here, and, and these the same elements do something else on another diagram. So they can find some inconsistencies, they can find some defects, they can tell you that your diagrams are not good enough. Again, they can give you, the AI can give you estimates. The AI can tell you how much, how long the project will take. Maybe the AI can even write code for you. If it's the diagram is here, maybe we can you know, automatically generate code. And you don't even need AI for that. There are tools that, that can help you with these tools which are quite old. They were in the market 20 years ago. Where you draw the class, di the class diagram, and then you click generate code, and they give you Java code. Uh, these tools existed a long time ago. And again, tests. Tests, we can generate tests if we know diagrams. So that was step number two, design. Step number three is coding. That's how we write code. And we write code in the, in the ID. That's probably the most interesting part here, is writing code in the ID. But who knows what ID is? Integrated development. Integrated development environment, that's right. So ID basically is what modern programmers are using to write code. We don't use text editors, not as, as much as we were using them 20 years ago. Now most of programmers are using this, this tool where you type your code and the tool helps you to type your code. Now I'll show you how it helps. This tool is called, what's the name of this one? IntelliJ. IntelliJ, that's right. Yeah, that's IntelliJ, that's what I use for, for Java. Actually it was, it is created by a, a Russia, a company uh, coming from, from, from Russia, intelligent, from JetBrains. It's quite popular. It's, it's probably the most popular right now in the market. So there are basically two ways, two things, which a good ID can help us programmers while we are working with the code. Uh, it's basically code completion and code generating. Two things. This is code completion. So I say app dot, and it gives me suggestions. It's called code completion. So instead of typing the full line, I just type a few letters, and it completes the code for me. That's code completion. Now, it is pretty powerful. So IntelliJ will give you really good suggestions, really good code completion, but it's not the end. In the future, we may have machine learning involved, we may have artificial intelligence, which will give us even faster. The suggestions will be faster, the suggestions will be smarter, because sometimes IntelliJ doesn't know what to say. Sometimes you still have to type in your letters, and sometimes you need to complete the line yourself. But in the future, I think we will have more and more powerful IDs which complete the code for it. So code completion, it's a, it's a very large territory for investigation, for research. So you as, as researchers, as future researchers, as programmers, future programmers, you can do a lot if you actually uh, create some new uh, I don't know, tactics, new methods for completing the code. And the second one is code generating. Code generating, look, I have this error here, it's in, right, it's in, it's in red, and I move my uh, cursor here, I click the, the, the menu is here, and I say surround it with try and catch. And it generates code for me. So it's not completing what I'm typing, but I'm saying generate the whole block of code here for me. It was one line, and it makes it look, it makes it longer, larger. It says try, catch, and throw exception. So I just click one button, and it, com and, and it generates the code for me. It may generate larger pieces. Right now, I'm using IntelliJ every day, and I'm not really happy with code generating at all. They just help me a little bit here and there. I would love more. I would love to see more code generating, you know, templates, I don't know, some logic there. So when I, when I click somewhere, I would love to, to get even, you know, better help from the, from, from the ID. 
from my environment, more help, I need more there. And that's where I think researchers and programmers of the future will contribute for code generation. That will help a lot of programmers in the world to write code faster and better because when we generate the code, the code which is generated, it's error free, it's good. It's generated by the machine and it's, it, it doesn't have errors. It's always good, well, to a certain extent. So again, we get the code, we send it to AI, and we get new code. That's what AI is for. Code generating, code completing, code on the left, code on the right. That's why I think we can expect in the future from the, from the AI. Even though we don't know what AI is, but still. Next step, unit tests. Let's say we have the product, which we create. The calculator. I mean, the, not the real calculator, but the piece of software which calculates. And now we need to make sure that the calculator actually works. So we write unit tests. We say, uh, we send 5 plus 5, and we check what's coming out. 10. Okay, it works. We send 0 multiplied by 1. The 0 coming out. Okay, it works. So we test something. But, for example, we didn't test for, for a floating point, like 1.2 multiplied by 2. We don't know whether it works or not. So we need more tests. The more tests we write, the better is the software. That's the, that's the, the common uh, assumption. <coughs> Most people will agree with that, that when you have a piece of code and then you have just a small amount of tests, it's not a good problem. When you have a piece of code and a lot of tests around it, a lot of many, many lines like this, then the quality of code is better, higher. The more tests you have, the better the problem. Now we mostly write them manually. So, well, according to my experience, people write this test. Programmers, they write the code, they create the product, and they write unit tests. They, they write them more, they don't really like that. Most programmers don't like writing unit tests. In the end, we have bad products. We have products that crash, we have mobile applications that don't work, we have troubles, we have problems. We may ask artificial intelligence in the future to write tests for us. For example, in this case, you can, you can create yourself a machine which will write multiple lines like this, different lines, testing this calculator from different angles, multiplying, I don't know, doing all the possible arithmetic operations. And you can write thousands of these tests. There is a lot of possibility, a lot of a big territory for research how these uh, tests can be uh, created. So another application of artificial intelligence is to help programmers to write tests, to analyze the code, to analyze the existing tests and produce new tests. That's what AI can do. Analyze what we have now, do some conclusions, make some I don't know, decisions, and then produce new tests, which will help us to improve. Who knows what tests are for? I mean, what they're in general for. To test the code and to help programmers to develop next, to develop more code. So when you have a product and you have uh, just a little amount of tests, then you are afraid to break something there. You're afraid to change the problem. If you touch something which is not covered by unit tests, you may break it and nobody will notice. You will notice. You will not notice. But if you have a product which is fully covered by unit tests, every single operation is tested, then you can take this product, modify something, and then try to run all the tests. If all of them say, okay, 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 it means, okay, I didn't break anything. But if at least one of them say that something is wrong, I know that I broke something. So I, I can develop a faster, I can develop more safer, I can develop stress-free, there's no stress for me. Because I know that tests, they protect me. They tell me what's wrong before I break something and deliver that to my customers. So tests are very important instruments for programmers. Good programmers know that, bad programmers don't know that. So that was about testing. Now the static analysis. Static analysis is the step where we take a look at the code. This is, uh, this is a piece of code which I took from uh, Google Guava. Google Guava is the pretty large uh, Java library uh, written by developers mostly from Google. It's one of the largest files there. It's a huge, about 5,000 lines of Java code. And everywhere you see the red color, the red means that IntelliJ doesn't like it. 
So IntelliJ tells me that something is wrong in, in here and there and here and there. I'm just scrolling it. You know, just a full scroll with a long, long file. So you can see how many pieces IntelliJ doesn't like in this file. So the code works. It's a library. It's a library very popular in the world. One of the most popular uh, Java libraries in the world. Apache Guava. But you see how many places still need improvement. There's a lot of things which we can improve in this, in this file. I'm not even saying about the length of the file. So it's 5,000 lines. It's absolutely, uh, absolutely wrong that they have a file of this, of this length. It's too much. But take a look at the amount of red lines, uh, which, which tell us that, uh, that we need to improve something. So static analysis is looking at the code, at the code that works and telling us that something needs improvement to make the code better. So static analysis is uh, quite old, again, quite old territory where there are a lot of tools, a lot of instruments exist there and people use it, but still, we can apply artificial intelligence, we can apply machine learning, we can research, and we can create new instruments and new tools which will find even more red lines which will find even more problems, which will tell programmers even, which will um, uh, recommend programmers to improve their code even, even better. Now we have enough information. We have a lot. Look at how many red pieces we have, and Google ignores them. Ignores them. I mean, they don't fix it. Maybe some of them are not so important, but, but still, there's many, many red, red pieces. But in the future, we'll have more powerful static analyzers. And some analyzers will even um, uh, make even smart decisions and will, will even make suggestions of how you can improve the code. For example, take a look at this piece of code. This is Ruby. It's not Java, it's Ruby. It's a simple method. Say hello, we get a parameter friend, and then we put hello and friend.name. So do you see any potential problems here? What may go wrong with this code? I mean, dot name. Say again? Dot name. Dot name, or what do you mean? Or if it's no. Exactly. Yes. If it's nil, yeah. If the nil is provided, then most probably is this friend.name will result in nil pointer exception. So the code will most probably fail. So that's a, an error which a programmer can see immediately. But the Ruby compiler, the Ruby engine, doesn't see the root for, for the Ruby language. It's okay that the code is clean, the code just works. But the programmer can see that. We can create a static analyzer, a, a code fixer, which will take a look at this code and say, how about this? How about adding one new line here and saying raise exception if friend is nil. So this is the line which can be suggested by a static analyzer. Well, by, it's not exactly the static analyzer, it's like a code fixer. But it runs when we do static analysis. So I wrote the code, here's my code, look at it, the machine says, hold on, we need this line, you forgot this line, add it there. So that's what artificial intelligence can do. We can give this the code for the artificial intelligence, and it can give you warnings. It can tell you something is wrong here and there, red, 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 fix it. Or it can even tell you that you have some bug, bugs immediately. Or it can even, even give you patches, like we just saw in this example. But here's the patch, add this line, you need this line. So that's what, that's what we can do in the area of static analysis. The next step is review. When you review the code, you have the author of the code, you have the reviewer of the code, and you send that reviewer a pull request. That's how we work now. So when I work in the team, always or usually, in most cases, if two people work or more people work, I create the code and I send that code to another programmer in a pull request. Well, a long time ago it was patches, so we were using patches, like the, the patch, probably nobody remembers that time. But that was like you know, 15 years ago, maybe more, where people were creating like additional files and sending those files by email and saying, hey, there's the, the patch I would like you to apply, and that's my modification to the code. And then the reviewer says, yes, okay, I accept that code, and the code goes to the repository. That's how code review process works. And actually, these pull requests, they were introduced by GitHub. So GitHub was the company which introduced the idea of pull requests, and that's why GitHub was so popular. The GitHub, the, 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 the number one innovation of GitHub was not the, the, the right interface, it's the idea of pull requests. 
So they said, how about we do pull requests? How about we allow programmers to exchange code from repository to repository just by a simple click, send the pull request. And that's how they got a, a multi, multi million dollar company. So now we use pull requests. We all use pull requests. And when the pull request is coming, a person, a human being, a, 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 another programmer has to look at this code and make the decision, is it okay or not okay? Do I accept this code or not? We can use artificial intelligence here. We can use the machine, which will take a look at this code and say yes or no. Do we accept this code or we don't accept this code? Again, we need research there. We need to some, some new methods, some new instruments where we get the code, send it to artificial intelligence, plus we send the information of the author, who is the author of the code, maybe some information from continuous integration, and then they say, they give us the warnings. It's okay or not, or where are the problems? That has to be done by artificial intelligence. Some machine will decide, and if we create such machines, they exist right now in the market. Some of them, very primitive. Mostly they're primitive, they're not artificial intelligence. They're just looking at the code, and, and sometimes they can, for example, tell you that uh, the test coverage is uh, low now. So it was high before, and now after your patch, the test coverage is lower. This thing. But I haven't seen, maybe it's just me, but I haven't seen really something smart in this, in this area. Like, like really com computers thinking and deciding that this patch, this pull request is bad, and this pull request is good. That's the future, I think. That will be very important. If we create these machines, robots, who will be sitting in the projects, looking at what's going on, checking these pull requests, and raising red flags where they see problems, that will help a lot. That will really help programmers uh, to work better. Uh, the step next one is deliver. So we package, we put pieces together, we package, and we deliver to production. Um, how artificial intelligence can help there? I only found one idea that we can say, the machine can say, is it ready to be delivered or not? This decision could be made by computers. And it's important, that's interesting to hear the computer there, because it's always a very important decision for a team. We were working for a week, we package everything, what now? Do we deliver it to the market or we work for another week? Well, in that case, you probably need to test requirements as well. Yeah, most probably, yeah. Most probably here we not only check the product, maybe we can check the requirements as well. You're right, yeah. So maybe the input should not, not only be the product, but also the requirements. And then the machine will say, okay, we compare the requirements, we compare the product, you're right. And then we decide, time to go, or maybe we need more work, more coding, more, more something more. Testing, manual tests. So manual test is when the product is ready, it's somewhere in front of the customer, and then we do this. So we're trying to break it. We're trying to manually do something with the product and, and, and decide what's, what, what is breakable, how we can actually break this product and how we can actually find bugs. Now, programmers are in another room. Programmers, test, I mean, unit testing, programming, it's all over. Now we have the product in front of us. Now we need to decide. It's a mobile application. Now I'm trying to break it. I'm trying to install it here. I'm trying to install it on a different phone. I'm trying to play with it and how to break it, how to actually find inconsistency. Like in this example, the car is out of the factory. It's already done. Designers, test, everybody finished work. Now we're testing. And, and manual testers, they are now people mostly. They're people who are trying to test their, their manual testers. That's probably uh, some of the jobs which you can get if you just, you know, if you're, if you're young, you can get to a big company. Sometimes they, they, they offer testing jobs for really junior people, the junior developers who don't know how to write code yet, but they can test. It's not so difficult, right? You can just start a car and see how it crashes. And then you record, okay, it crashes here, it crashes there, bugs are here, there. Uh, however, the artificial intelligence can help us a lot. Again, we can take a look, plus requirements, and the machine can tell us where are the bugs. Somehow. I don't know how exactly the machine will do that. I haven't seen any real examples of that. I don't know exactly how it's possible, but that's the, that's the task for you, I mean, future research, to find a way to uh, to invent some algorithms, some, you know, some techniques, how you can uh, break the product and tell us what's wrong. And the final step, we validate. So we actually give the product to the customer and the customer requires like, uh, reacts like this. 
the product is in front of the customer and the customer says, what? This is not exactly what I was waiting for. And, um, and we are trying to convince the customer that that was the product we were developing and the customer is not happy. How artificial intelligence is going to help us? I don't know. I don't know how to apply artificial intelligence at that step. Maybe that's for you to think about. That's all I wanted to say about AI.